for today is you know getting a little bit into what is product management and uh, then understanding product management and build trap uh, the next is how do we become aware we are in a build trap um, and and if we know how do we escape right is there a very simple framework for us to escape right um, i'll try to keep it very simple um, without getting into a lot of jargon words but if i'm still using somewhere something and it's not clear um, you guys can ping or put it on the chat box so that i can quickly respond while i'm on that slide okay all right i'll give you like 10 quick seconds for you to read the statement and i'll read it for you too so what is product management it is maximizing and delivering value right in quotes to the business and customer repeatedly i'll let you read and consume this first okay i'm hoping you got some uh, seconds to consume it so I'll, i'll explain it this to you see whatever we do right whether we do a product launch whether we do a customer interview whether we are um, you know working with engineering team managing developers managing product managers um, coming up with a product market strategy at the end of the day uh, we are trying to do give value to two entities here hey if someone is unmuted can you please go on mute there is some disturbance from your end uh right so at the end of the day what we are trying to do here is maximize and deliver value to two entities business is the company for whom you are developing the product right uh, like if i am a product manager at high radius for me business would be high radius right because i'm developing product for high radius high radius is finally is the brand is the company which is going and selling if you are doing it for google google is the business if you are doing it for freshworks freshworks is the uh, business right or whatsapp is if you are doing it for whatsapp whatsapp is so that's the business entity right and the second is the customer customer is obviously your client which can be a b2c or a b2b but at the end of the day customer is who is going to use your product right and the key here is you are delivering value to both these entities repeatedly that means in a continuous way right because if you're doing it as a one time thing so for example if a bank approaches you to build an application or a friend of yours is uh, you know opening up a portal and he wants a website to be built and he reaches out to you or a, you know that is all one time thing right but generally products are something which is going to provide value to the customers on a repetitive basis right like for example if you buy a shoe you will use it multiple times you will not just throw it off once as an example right um if you are going to search something on google you are using it multiple times if you are using a netflix you are using it multiple times so you always remember that you are trying to maximize and deliver value to two entities in a repetitive way and that's where the role of product management becomes so much critical okay so now I'll, you know dive deep dive a little bit more here that what does this value mean for business or the company and what does this value mean for you know a customer right so let's deep dive here a little bit so for a business or a company uh, it can be a sales revenue because ultimately they have to sell the product as why that your product is a platform using which they are getting revenue like a amazon e-commerce platform or it's a product which the company is selling to the customer like a order to cash software or uh, um, you know an analytics software or you know something which you are selling directly to the customer and you are hence getting the revenue um, if it is a saas software there are always metrics like you know booking churn billing churn which is about okay once you hire the customer you don't want that customer to churn that means move away from you right so if you are if your customer is going away from you even before you made them live then it is a booking churn if a customer is moving away from you after you made them live then it's a billing churn right again these are all examples right it can also be okay i am building a product which has to give me leads and hence lead generation is um, is is important there right or i am trying to build a, a functionality in the product which will get me a lot more leads so i am building some product for the future right now it will not give me sales revenue but because i'm building for the future it will give my company more leads uh, people will uh, look up to my company as a innovation uh, friendly company or you are building a product related to data 
Uh, so the value for your company is uh, you are the more clients you're acquiring, you're actually sitting on a pile of data and maybe that data can be a new revenue source for you, right? Or you are trying to become an SME or a knowledge capital for, uh, for, for a certain domain. So the value for a business or a company can be many, but this is how the company will view themselves as based on what vision the company has, right? Uh, for the customers, the value for customers is not the products which we deliver, but the value for customers are the desires or the needs that the product fulfills, right? That's the value, not the products which we deliver. So um, if you're talking to a business, it can be, okay, how much productivity did you improve for that division for whom you are building the product, right? If you're building an HR management software, are you really able to improve the productivity of the HR team in a company? That means are they able to do more with less as an example, right? Uh, or let's say the HR team has a certain goal or a target um, that, you know, I want to uh, retain my employees or I want to have employee happiness index or NPS score go up by so-and-so percentage. Mm -hmm. uh, then are you able to help them improve in their goals or targets? Or if they have a project-based goals, like I want to finish all projects on time, um, like a appraisal process or whatever, then is the software, HR software, helping the um, HR team do that as an example. So those are business value drivers, right? And it can also be tactical, right? Tactical is, oh, you know what? Today, everything is just in different sheets and Excel and drives and some shared folder. Um, there is some soft, different five or six different tools with, for the same process. I just want one centralized system, right? It can also be a tactical um, goal or value for the customer. Right, but 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 please understand that the value for the and the value for the customers are very different, right? And sometimes they might be conflicting too, right? Uh, it can be that your sales team wants to sell a product which will get you revenue, but you know that that product that your customers need a whole different uh, set of features and for them to realize value. So because the person who is finally buying and the person who is finally using might be different or you are selling for the future, but your existing customers need a different uh, different kind of a feature. So making that balance between both the work, business or company as well as customers and finally delivering value is where product management uh, comes in as a big uh, you know, critical or, or product management department plays a very critical role, right? Now here, the tricky part. I, 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 I do have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, when you uh, so uh, so Nali, when you look at the WhatsApp business, right? So we yeah. can see there's a straightforward, uh, you know, value proposition for the end consumer, right? That we can see very, uh, you know, there's a plain vanilla, uh, yeah. you know, the solution WhatsApp provide, you know. But when yeah. you look at the, uh, you know, what value we are giving to business, you know, I mean, as an overall company. Since, as we know very well, that WhatsApp does, does not have a, do, I mean, do not have a revenue model, right? They do not have a right. revenue model for sales. They do not yeah. even store data, you know, chatting, they encrypt, decrypt, right? But you, they do not store at their server side. Then what value we are giving to the business? As per the definition, what you mentioned, you know, maxima, maximizing and delivering the value to the both stakeholders, right? Business as well as customers. So customer, we can see that, but what in case of WhatsApp? There's a isn't there a contradiction in that definition when it, when we uh, talk about WhatsApp business model? Yeah, because that's a very they're, good they're not delivering any value to the business or company. But, yeah, but, I, I but, but how do you know that they don't have any values? I mean, as far as the pointers mentioned, I'm trying to compare. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's what I'm saying. This is not a comprehensive list, but I can tell you, right? I mean, beware that I know they encrypt and decrypt data, but uh, again, I, I'm not I'm not the right person to comment on that, but uh, there is there is some long term strategy which WhatsApp has for sure with respect to why they are Ashwin. not taking the revenue and and you know what data they can use and they cannot use, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it is not it is not uh, all um, you know just out there like in, and most importantly for them they are trying to build a platform first. They are trying to first have all users on the same platform. So think about it. Uh, after mm -hmm. WhatsApp, so many different social media, uh, you know, uh, messaging platforms have come over, right? Including Telegram, Signal, and whatnot, right? How many 
uh, how why people have gone to those platforms too but is it that people have truly completely left whatsapp mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right yeah. as an example so maybe for them at this point um their their value is i want to be the single platform where messaging happens and once i do that i'll figure out my monetization and that's what their company's vision is also quite possible it's more it's more of organization strategy long term yes yes exactly so every like for example someone wants to become a knowledge capital someone wants to just acquire data, uh, data. they may not get a direct revenue from that right but but there is some long term strategy there which you or i might may or may not be aware Right. Can so, some valuation perspective also. Yeah. Yeah, fine. Yeah. So, uh, myself, Papni, here. Can we compare this uh, to a geo means uh, ready-made uh, example we have? The at where at the very start, geo was free. Then it slightly increases increase the user count by giving the free data and made people dependent on geo. and when they collected the customers uh, so large uh, who are dependent mm-hmm. on them they suddenly increased the price and so which Not was patient. a revenue generation could be possible so i don't want to comment on that yeah and in the interest of time i'll probably try to moderate it a little bit because you know i have many more slides to cover uh, so great points uh, but uh, maybe if i can request the team that unless you have i mean if you have something like what uh, you know the current question was a very valid question but otherwise i'll hold up the questions towards a little bit to the end if that's okay and then um, so that we complete the session on time because i don't know how we are doing on time for the rest of the group i can go a little over but i'm not sure about the rest of the group okay is that fine for everyone priyanka are you fine with that okay. looks like priyanka is on mute that would be better yeah yeah all right but but yeah i think uh, good good that we are engaging right so 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 this is where i want to go next right so we want to maximize and deliver value to the business and the customers repetitively but by doing what right how will we do it so that's where we are saying the product manager role is to continuously react to the evolving constraints or changes to the customer or user ecosystem and also to the company ecosystem right so we will see that uh, what is the customer ecosystem so remember the customer ecosystem or constraints like you might say oh i built the product once and i'm done right why do i need a product manager once i have rolled out the product you need a product manager because the customer ecosystem and the business ecosystem keeps on changing right uh, either you have new customers new industries or even the same customers their needs which was there five years back and what they expected out of your product might not be same five years later right because they are influenced by friends colleagues Uh, their tech own tech ecosystem if they are using tech um, products their own tech competencies are improving right and they are influenced by the latest trends in the industry or market right simple thing is maybe 5 years back people didn't worry so much about getting a recommendation on e-commerce software on how to buy but now that's become so common that people are like oh can i get a recommendation um, can can google give me a recommendation those kind of stuff right so the so the implicit expectation of the user and the competency as well as how they are influenced by the friends colleagues and products around them does change their expectation level right than what it was 5 6 10 years back so it keeps on changing uh and then the business ecosystem also has a lot of constraints right you might want to build an amazing product but you might not have the right resource bandwidth there might be process constraints security constraints compliance constraints right the focus areas of the organization might be very different than what you are thinking you want to do because typically every organization will have one global charter every single year or every six months or every three months and then there are internal stakeholders too who are who might be using your product in some way or the other and uh, their expectation might also be very different right so what i'm trying to tell you here is that are uh, the role of this product management team becomes much more critical not just because you have to deliver value but also because you would have to look at this both these ecosystems equally with an equal lens and do the right prioritization on where to focus and where to not right so and then i'll also tell you what is in product management right so a lot of times uh, people feel okay the client asked me to build a feature right let me note down the requirement in a beautiful way understand their as is um 
the sales told me that if I build this feature, I'll get revenue, right? Uh, so let me go add that, right? So that's the job of an order taker, someone who is just writing files after files and dumping it down, that's an order taker, right? And the other thing is, oh, I'm just, you know, having a developer print code, like, you know, the millions of lines of code I print, the more, the more features I build and release, the, the better I am as a product manager, right? Uh, but just think about it, right? Uh, if you go to any, even Microsoft Word or Google Doc or for that matter, Gmail or, or even WhatsApp, any, any kind of product, even Amazon, the portal where we all go and shop or uh, Netflix, they have so many buttons out there. How many features do we really use on a day-to-day -day basis? Right? Something for us to think. Does that mean they should not release other features? No, but remember that all the features which are released are not necessarily used by the users on a day-to-day -day basis. So just being an order taker or printing a lot of code does not make us a great product manager, right? So that's what I wanted to, or does not correlate to a lot of revenue consistently. So this is how I'm trying to call out that this is not product management. Now, given that we have the context of what product management is and isn't, let's go a little bit into what's the build trap is, right? Build is very simple, guys. Build is correlated to developing a software, building a feature um, where you are investing, you have a, you define a business requirement, there is a developer who goes builds it. So you're building it, right? You're, it's no more in ideation phase. You're building the feature and releasing it to production, right? So the answer first is product managers often fall prey to build trap. And that happens when the focus is on output, um, like a feature is delivered or not, versus the focus being on outcome, right? So there is a difference between output and outcome. Whenever you're building and you say, okay, whether a feature is delivered or not in a release successfully, which a lot of product owners or scrum or agile processes follow, that's actually output, right? But the actual product success comes from outcome. Outcome is, is my feature being truly used by the client and is it helping them fulfill their needs? Uh, is my decision really helping in low churn, like, my customers are not going away or increasing revenue. So those are the kind of uh, questions or answers which are important. And if our decision is leading to an outcome and we are using the outcome to drive whether I should prioritize that or not, then that's the right job. But if we are using, uh, oh, this feature is excellently delivered or not as a criteria, then that is output driven. So we fall prey to the build trap lot often subconsciously because we're running in this agile process or you know fast track process where we have to deliver features over features releases after releases uh, and lot often uh, subconsciously we might forget about the outcome right so what is build trap then okay output versus outcome right so the build trap is nothing but if you're focusing on output then we are into the build trap. If you're focusing on outcome, then we are not into the build trap. It's as simple as that. Okay. Now, what's the impact of a build trap? So let's say we, you know, we fell prey to a build trap. Something happened and uh, we are into the build trap. So what is the impact of it, right? The product team will ship a ton of features, which is awesome, right? Um, new features is always great. We take pride as product managers in releasing new features, right? Why shouldn't we? That's our job. We should ideate, we should build features, we should release, right? We should use the new technologies available out there, isn't it, right? So product team keeps on shipping new features. And then um, it could happen that your features are not necessarily contributing to the real value for the customers because you are building a ton of features. But uh, is, is, is anyone looking at whether those features are really adding value, really getting revenue? Uh, is the user actually using the features? Uh, and you will often find, like even in the Shark Tank, if you might, people who watched it, you must have seen a lot of people who came and said, hey, we have X products. And the next question would be, okay, what is driving your revenue? And maybe it is two out of 10 products, which is driving the revenue. And the rest eight are probably not so well used, right? So remember that you are shipping the features, which is great because someone asked, but the cost which you're incurring in shipping these features may or may not be giving repetitive real value for all customers, quite possible, right? The number three thing could be the company or product allows them to be disrupted, right? Because now you're shipping a lot of features and you're not necessarily providing the real value. 
it's quite possible that there is some other company out there who comes who understands what the user needs are at the next level and they went ahead and you know uh, launched that and while you are still focused on shipping the features of your own kingdom on own territory um, there is some other company which is probably disrupting you right so you are we are allowing ourselves to be disrupted if we are just building features right and then then what will happen ultimately is we will either lose market share or competition will take over right and then this is a vicious circle now competition takes over so now you want to ship more features to keep up with the competition then as you do it you're entering into a vicious circle of falling into the build trap right so that's the impact uh, uh, folks here that you know if you're falling into the build trap it literally is a vicious circle and we need to break this to get out of it right so now the next question i'm sure a lot of you will have is how do how how to become aware that if we are in a build trap or not right i mean it's it's so easy to fall into this trap but is there a way for us or a mechanism for us to be aware that we are in a build trap and maybe you know recognizing that we are in a build trap is the first thing we can do to get out of it right so yes so i'll give you a few scenarios here right um uh, and you can ask yourself the first question you can ask yourself always is why am i building this feature right if and whatever i say here are examples so don't read this as uh, you know sure short answer so if your answer is oh my sales team sold this and the market needs this okay great the consulting mentioned that if i don't deliver this functionality i will lose this client right um, and i need to deliver within so and so release or oh my manager asked me to build this feature right um or my client asked me to build this feature right if any of these answers are true or some similar pattern you see in your mind when you're asking this question then you are into a build trap right the expected answer from you should be what is the value that the user will get from the feature right so why am i building this feature i own it the ask might have come from anywhere whether it is sales or consulting or customer value or real customer or um you know your own peer product manager or your own super boss or exec team or whoever does not matter or your own ideation also but ultimately if you are able to justify the value the user will get from the functionality or the feature then you are owning up the problem and you are not falling into the pit right the second checkpoint who am i building this feature for right very easy question right and your answer might be also a good one like a specific client or a bank or a corporate or a friend of mine who is a sports person i know has this pain point and hence i am resolving this issue or i am bringing up this uh, discovery into life okay awesome but this is also a possibility of a build trap because you might not have done enough investigation and maybe these users who you have talked to or customers who you have talked to are just those one off and they are becoming a product manager here and telling you what i want right so who am i building this feature for has to be a little bit more certain like are you sure that you know a certain user in a certain industry or a certain you know will surely use it or do you have a use case which you feel is applicable for more than one client or the entire user persona right remember repeatability right and not targeted at a specific customer is key here right if there is repeatability of or of the usage across different users for sizable chunk of users and you are not targeted or getting fixated by a ask coming from a very specific input like a customer then maybe you are not into the build trap as an example right let's look at the next question right what value will the user or client get right and if your answer is well the client will be able to send email better because i have built a great email utility tool or i uh, or they'll be able to download the data seamlessly and now store it anywhere they want or they can edit a transaction like they're booking a ticket they want to edit it they can edit a transaction then you're talking about feature and functionalities but you're not talking about value right so what is value value would be oh this will improve the productivity of my user by so and so percentage and giving them this time saving as an example right so that is value right so what value will the user or client get is something again very important for you to think about okay 
Now there are a few other situations or general scenarios I'll cover it for you. So what's keeping you busy? If you ask that question to yourself and if your answer is, you know what, my clients or customers need some amazing features to be built for a successful go live and I'm busy there. Or, you know, my engineering team, I have to keep on feeding them user stories, release after release, week after week to keep them busy. Or I have to write very detailed product requirement specifications that if PR is here and ensure that my engineering has all doubts cleared and that's keeping me busy. Mm. Do question yourself again because you your all your answers might be tactical and may not be value oriented, right? What's your biggest challenge? If your answer is like, oh, you know what? Consulting or sales, uh, one says everything is important and I'm just not sure how to prioritize or in my engineering team is losing, slowing me down and they really don't want me to build what I designed. They're not aligned with me. Again, that could be that you're into build trap because maybe you don't know what the customer wants, what is the value, what is the quantitative advantage your business or company will get and hence you're not able to convince your stakeholders quite possible right or you are falling into the trap of some stakeholders who feel everything is important and while you know about how to prioritize you're not able to articulate it and you're not able to articulate it if i do another why there maybe because you don't know exactly what the value and or not able to logically explain right so so think about it that also a little bit um, and then maybe let's ask one more question. When was the last time you talked to your customer? Uh, a lot of product managers tell me, hey, I don't think as a product manager, I'm supposed to go talk to the customer directly. Uh, I do have the, the customer facing teams and, and I get a lot of value from that. Yeah, I'm not saying you go and talk to your customers on an everyday basis, but then it should not also be that you're away from your customers, right? You should know uh, unless you empathize and understand what your users need and empathize with the customers, you'll not be able to build the products which will add value to them. You might be building products which add value to your company, but in turn, it will not even add value to your company because you just don't know your users well, right? So these are the three, you know, um, and I'll give you a very, very uh, a simple example, right? In one of our product journeys, uh, we realized that we had a calling functionality and uh, some of our clients were, very excited to use, but they were not using it, right? And then when we did a deep dive, we realized that it just needed some uh, change management for some clients, whereas for other clients, it needed some reporting functionalities and not an advanced, more calling functionality, but a reporting functionality so that the manager in that organization can drive accountability or change management. In certain companies, we realized the problem was very different, wherein uh, they had some internal compliance issues which were not allowing them. So we had to work past their legal and compliance team to get it rectified. So your problems can be anywhere. It might not be just feature functionality, right? So that's where I'm trying to say staying very close to the customers might help you understand what's happening as a pattern, again, not as an exception, right? But that's also a trap. You should not be too much into the customers and do whatever your customers want. Then you will again fall into the build trap. Okay, so now that we have talked a little bit about how do you assess first, right? That identify that you are into a build trap or not. The last chapter I'll cover is how to escape this build trap, right? Okay, we know we are in a build trap or some kind of a build trap. How do we escape it, right? What is the toolkit for that? So I'm going to cover that up a little bit now, right? So um, by the way, this uh, I have purposefully put here because there is actually an amazing book called as Escaping the Build Trap. Um, and, and I would recommend all of you to go read it if you have not. Um, definitely a must read book. Okay. Okay. So I'll give you a framework here. A lot of you might have know me, you know, you might know this framework, but if, in case you don't know, I'll, I'll anyways go ahead and explain. Right. So the first thing is you have to break the uncertainty around you. Right. Uh, remember as a product manager, we come across many data points right? Uh, asks which are coming from the customers, some data, some statistics, uh, engineering team is saying something, data science team is saying something, my manager is saying something, the exec team has a different vision, the sales team is all over, like they, they are just running after revenue. Marketing is revenue, uh, running after their lead generation process. If you have a consulting or an external partner, uh, and if you are a B2B software company, you'll have other kind of issues. So there are a lot of facts and lot of asks there, isn't it? So how do we break this uncertainty, right? So the framework is very simple. It's called 
known unknown two by two metrics, right? So what what does it tell you here that uh, there are four quadrants? So let's talk about the known known. So the known known are facts. These are things which we are very well aware, we understand, and we can bet our money on it. We know it for so sure that we can bet. Even if someone asks us that, can you put ten thousand dollars on this on the statement of yours? We know it, right? So we are not making any assumptions, any opinions here. It is a fact. We know it for sure. So those are like known knowns. So we know that we know, right? That is what is known knowns. Then comes known unknowns. There are always situations or things which we know we don't know, and we are curious and we want to know know about them, right? That's also to a very good territory to be in, right? I know what I don't know, and hence I should go and ask questions. It's so simple, right? So I don't understand there are things which I don't know. So I have identified that I have to go and ask those questions. So that is known unknown, right? Then comes unknown known, right? What is unknown known? It's like intuition, right? Things I believe is true, but may or may not be true, right? I'm not hundred percent sure of, but I have a strong gut feeling or intuition that what I know is true, right? Uh, or maybe they are so much you believe into it that you don't want to go and figure out whether that is factual or it's a, uh, it's your intuition. So that is unknown known, right? The knowns which we do not want to know. We know, but but then. There is something which we also don't know. So this is like the unknown known, right? And then comes the unknown unknown. Unknown unknown is generally the discovery, the, the place where we should do the maximum discovery, right? Where uh, these are things we, now we are neither aware nor we fully understand. So we really do not know what we do not know, right? Like you might not know what is your customer pain point in a specific area of work, which is fine, right? So that's the discovery. So we don't know that we don't, what we don't know, right? We might be missing out these facts. Most often than not, we fall into a trap because uh, we are assuming the unknown known and the unknown unknowns as facts or questions, right? Um, and, and, and so we are like, oh, I just know what exactly I need to ask. So you ask that question and you fall into a trap because you didn't ask it further, right? So you don't know what you don't know. So most often, uh, we will fall into a trap because we are considering intuition and discovery as facts and questions, right? So the best thing for you, given this framework to do, is you should try to convert as much unknown knowns and unknown unknowns to facts, being the first thing, or at least to a question phase where you know exactly what to ask and to clarify that. That is the most important, right? So spend time in reducing the unknown unknowns and known unknowns, right? So next is how do you escape, right? So I'll give you like, I simply tell this to my team and everyone is like a 3D framework, that's three Ds. And then there are a couple more points, but there are three Ds which are very important. One is devil in the details. What is devil in the details? The moment you know even a fact uh, which you get to know here or a question, uh, or if you're on a discovery mode, especially then, you should get to the bottom level yeah, of it. Right? So let me let me play this. Uh, you know, a lot of you might have seen this, but maybe a recap. Let me play this video for you. Hold on. It's called the five by framework. Uh, let me know when you hear when you're able to hear the sound. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Every supposedly technical problem is actually a human problem. That's why we ask the five whys. Five whys. The five whys. It's an old technique developed by Toyota. You just ask the question why five times, and then the nature of the problem, as well as its solution, becomes clear. Yo, Sagar, server crashed again. Not again. Well, let's do the five whys. Why did the server crash? We pushed a new API to that server. Why? We just launched a new feature. It probably used that API the wrong way. Why? Uh, we have a new engineer who doesn't know how to use that API properly. Why? We never trained him. Why? Because you didn't want to train him. You sent me an email that said, if they can't figure it out, screw them. Why? Because as a leader, you're a little bit incompetent, and you kind of know it, so you hide behind this tough guy, like, okay, veil. You know what? This whole thing is exactly why I would never buy a Toyota. Well, at least we figured it out, right? See, what seemed like a technical problem is actually a managerial problem. You know what? We can start offering a training program. I'll just have to uh, cut your salary by 25%. Why? Because I can't afford to pay you a full salary and have a training program. Why? We don't make enough money for that. We have no revenue coming in. Why? 
Because no one wants to buy what we're making. Why? So what we're making is worthless. Why? I think everyone who works here is incompetent. Well, well then we should stop asking the five whys. It's stupid. Why? Well, because I don't want my salary cut. Why? Well, I need money to buy things. Why? Because that's how I'm programmed by society. That's what well, society tells me that's what made make me happy. Why? Because a few corporations want me to keep buying stuff, you know? I'm like this sheep, you know? The, the, the fast food companies fat me up so then the healthcare industry can slim me back down. I'm just like a pinball being whacked around in an arcade so that one man can have it all! Why? Because they're the Illuminati or all right, so, so that probably, you know, tells you, right? I mean, just saw what happened in that video. So, so very simple, right? I'm not giving you any frame because Let's start with why. Keep asking that why, why, why. Till, till, you, till you reach that, that elemental level of truth from where you cannot anymore ask why. That will help you know all the unknowns, right? Um, so simple questions like this without any uh, specific framework sometimes to wander. So that I call as devil in the details, right? Very, very important. The next is look everything with the eye to the detail, right? Um, typically, when you look at, I mean, this is a very favorite, um, you know, uh, image which I have always on mind. When you look at someone's name, you only look at the first name and the last name. Very easy, right? But the middle name is often missed out, right? But if you're looking at the middle name with a lot of attention to detail, that is the level of eye to the detail which we recommend you. So if you're looking at a software, when you look at the screen, are you literally looking at pixel by pixel? How is the screen looking? What is the button? Where is it? Uh, why is the user using this, not using this? Looking at data, looking at the user experience, everything with that level of eye to the detail, right? And not just at a high level. So that is the second D, right? Uh, eye to the detail. The third D is obviously data, right? Uh, nothing, nothing can replace data. Uh, please don't overuse data because overutilization of data might be bad because you might not have data to uh, support you all the time. Uh, but with whatever data you have, you should at least try to get the best out of it or you should push to get the required data if you can and try to do a data-driven decision making like okay why should i add this feature okay it will help me improve the productivity by five percent okay how am i sure that it will improve the productivity by five percent is there data to back it up those are the kind of questions which you need to ask uh, right or if someone says you know what if i build this feature i'll be able to um assist a certain uh, user persona uh, you know save um, three hours every day. Oh, wow, awesome. But how three hours? What do they do during the day? Where do they spend their time today? What if they're not even spending three hours on that activity and you feel magically that you'll be able to save it? So we are flawed there, right? So that's where data will help you in build, in escaping the build trap. The last one is the success metrics, right? As I told you, there are success metrics for the company and there are success metrics for um, the you know, uh, customer. So you need to always think, what is the success metric for the company and what is the success metric for my customer? Like if a bank is buying your software, uh, maybe, I mean, if it is an onboarding software, they would want to see is the onboarding time for a customer reducing or not, or they might want to see if it is a, a end user software, they might want to see how many times is the, I mean, is the user glued onto that software? Are they able to sell more products to the user because the product is so user-friendly that they are able to buy more banking products from that or anything like that right so um, so those are so that's the bank thinking about it but you might have a, another company which is thinking of something completely different so that's where applying those right success metrics and knowing whether um, the product usage is going up or down is it in the right direction wrong direction is usage even the right metrics for your product what if your product is all about automation and you don't expect the user to use the product so that also is a question which can be asked right so success metrics so after three d's comes the success metrics um, which is important and the last is the emotional quotient right uh, remember that you need to make the customers fall in love with your product and Falling in love with your product happens from value, but it finally also happens from the emotional connect which the customers get out of your product. So you, if you're building features for the emotional connect, you need to be a little bit more careful here, but that doesn't mean you should never build a feature for emotional connect. Emotional connect generally is, oh, I really love this UI, you know, my 
two two user interfaces provides the same functionality like a lot of people love cred as an example just because they like the ui right and then there is functionality but a lot of people love the user interface as an example so those are the kind of things which you need to care for that okay is it really having an emotional attachment with the customers and that is going to drive usability for my customers am i really upgrading the life of my customer or user by providing this product um that's where the last thing would come uh, when it comes to building the right features and not falling into the build trap right uh, so with that i'll pause uh, i think that's it i had from my side i know we are just 2 minutes away from 8 pm but i can still work on another 5 to 10 minutes and take a couple more questions so i'll pause here and uh, stop sharing and um, yeah uh, interested to know feedback on how was the session do you do you get to learn something and interested to answer your questions all right lot of silence uh, okay, i have um, a question sonali sahil do other side yeah sahil go ahead so is there a fair balance uh, between the actual build trap or the value proposition that we are going to make as a product owner do we need to make a balance or do we really need to avoid the build trap completely yeah great question um in my mind i'm not saying don't build features but escaping the build trap means don't build features which will not add value so if that is what you meant sahil then we should avoid the build trap completely as much as possible it's a journey i mean if you are into build trap it will take you a while to get there but yes we should avoid the build trap completely because you there is no meaning in uh, building something which has no value correct got it thank you sonali hey uh, questions other questions right lot of silence i'm assuming no more questions but uh, any feedback anything guys you can unmute and ask if you wanted to add some perspective or you had a question but yeah um because you guys are silent and we are virtual a little bit of interaction will be great uh, sonali one question from this is pradyun so uh, i got the just that you were discussing that avoid the build trap but uh, as most of us are new product managers we are yeah. aspiring to be okay yes now uh, and there are different stakeholders that we are managing sales yes the company and of course now how do you know and i of course that you gave some framework but still how do you decide that because whenever you are going with your gut feeling or with a conviction there is a risk that you are also taking right so okay. how do you manage the stakeholder expectation because So suppose they are not in line with you so how do you manage those expectations and where do you again strike a balance between the senior stakeholders in the system as well as your team who were having a different opinion against your decision something on that sure yeah so i completely understand it especially if you are a budding product manager or an aspiring product manager you are in a new ecosystem which the ecosystem itself is into a build trap it will become very difficult uh, but but here is the thing right if you want to be a great product manager and i think every company will agree to this uh, that you need to be curious a right uh, so you can always ask the questions in a very amicable and data centric way which gives an aha moment to your leaders or stakeholders right a lot of times when you talk to your stakeholders you might get into an emotional battle like why is this guy asking me why is this guy buzzing me so much you know why is this guy just not going and doing their work you will have those pushbacks right why does he not understand the, that i just don't want to talk about this topic or just go build what i say man why are you even asking me these questions so you will face those pushbacks from the stakeholders but that's where the clarity comes in right so if you know your subject well if you know your domain well because you have done the devil in the details exercise you have done the i to the details exercise you have also looked at data uh, and or maybe you also have done some customer interviews and you know it much better than those stakeholders 
then you will be able to apply logic and explain it to them right and that's where uh, you would be uh, a different uh, you, i mean you would come across as a stronger person um, and you will win over your stakeholders because at the end of the day i'm assuming at least you will have one stakeholder among many who will understand logic um, and will get convinced at the same time you might have a stakeholder who knows more than you and in that case i would urge you to be curious to even know that um, and not get biased by what your decision is right uh, because it's not necessary that a product manager by themselves himself or herself will make the best decision uh, it's in the best interest of the product manager to listen to all the stakeholders too because a lot of times a stakeholder might know a certain topic about your product much better than you know in that case you should be open to listen to them but apply the same framework there too if they're saying an opinion ask them why in a very amicable way and uh, and understand and i believe that will help you earn respect even if there is some initial pushback does that answer your question for you yes yes no, no, that answer. thank you okay yeah all right um you're a little over time uh Kienka, uh Want to take it forward from here? Yeah, thank you, Sonali. Such a great presentation. Uh, so, like, uh, whatever question you guys have, you can, you know, uh, you can also put them on uh, our platform, TrueMelt, and we can take it forward from there also. Uh, 